Hi, a warm welcome to everyone. In this episode of Third Empire, we will take you through all the important events that took place last week. First off, IT sector results are out with the top companies reporting revenues and earnings broadly in line with expectations. But the future trajectory for the IT sector on the back of a global slowdown does look gloomy. We'll tell you why. Gold is widely known as an inflation hedge, but the prices remain subdued since the beginning of the Russia-Ukraine war. After revising India's outlook to stable from negative, Fitch Rating believes external risk pose limited risk to India's sovereign rating. We will also talk about these news. Let's begin. You're watching Informed Investor, the third empire and initiated by Research and Ranking. Tata Consultancy Services, Infosys, Hetzel Technologies and Wipro have all reported their September quarter earnings. Now, let me take you through how the top IT companies have performed this quarter. The IT business's revenues grew strongly in constant currency terms during the second quarter. Now, according to management commentary too, the deal pipeline and investment on enterprise technology are both still looking up. Now, however, given the macroeconomic challenges and likely recession in the United States and Europe caused by rising prices and interest rates, we do remain wary of the revenue growth trajectory for IT sector. Also, currency tailwinds are being provided by a stronger dollar despite other currencies weakening. Now, while the stronger dollar is a positive for the sector, do know that weakening European currencies such as the euro and pound will put additional downward pressure on the reported USD revenue growth. Due to growing salary revision costs, rising travel costs and rising retention costs, IT services companies' margins have been under pressure for the last few quarters. But in quarter two, sequ sequential margin recovery remained a notable highlight. Now, high utilization, forex gain and operating efficiency led to an improvement in overall operating margins for the top companies except for Wipro. But going forward, IT companies are facing varied global headwinds that will exert pressure on their profit margins. Now, coming to deal wins. All the top IT firms reported higher order bookings in September on a year-over-year -year basis with all companies indicating a good order pipeline as well. Now, order wins have improved wherein macro challenges were expected to impact the most. Now, this shows that the macros are not hitting demand yet. Do know that the reporting of order inflow differs among companies in IT sector. For instance, Infosys only discloses the value of large deals. Infosys won 27 large deals with total TCV of $2.7 billion, up 27.5% year-over-year in Q2, which is a pretty good number. At TCS2, the total contract value increased by 6.5%. HCL only reports net new business wins, which was up 6% from the same time last year. Now, the management is also confident of sustaining revenue growth momentum in the services businesses. Now, Wipro 2 had a solid 25% rise in large deal bookings. Now, one explanation for the sustained demand amid worries of recession is that businesses around the world are changing the way they do business. The reliance on technology has increased significantly. Now, of course, the pace of order wins was slow against earlier quarters, but none of them reported a year-over-year -year reduction in orders as such. Now, this is in contrast to the global IT spending trends. Now, as you can see on the chart on your screen, according to information services groups, global spending on IT and business services fell 3% year-over-year in the September quarter. So what explains these contrasting patterns of international IT spending and order inflows at Indian businesses, that is gains in market share? The information technology industry in India has experienced remarkable growth. This is one industry that has been meeting or even exceeding expectations while other industries that have experienced rough times. Now, in the last few decades, the Indian IT industry has successfully capitalized on numerous opportunities. Now, Indian IT has been gaining market share 
and most of the above mentioned companies are confident that they will continue to gain businesses. While all the companies reported healthy and stable deal wins this quarter and bullish expectations for the upcoming quarter, they also remained wary of the ongoing global market uncertainty. Now, this was highlighted in the management commentary. TCS and Infosys have highlighted delays in deal closure conversations with clients. TCS also added that some sectors like retail and insurance have started to show signs of slowdown in the US. The phrase Great Resignation was widespread for the past year since the job market started opening globally in the post-pandemic era. Now, this was driven by changing employee attitudes and expectations because of the pandemic. This was on the back of many reasons such as employee burnout, loss of work-life balance, demand for work-from-home opportunities, and a desire for maybe more meaningful work. As we all know, the tech industry is familiar with high turnover, there is fierce competition for talent, and also critical shortages in emerging technology experts. Hence, this particular industry has been hit hard by this trend. Now, attrition rates have been high across IT companies through the last few quarters as demand for technology talent with digital skills continue to outstrip supply. Now, most Indian IT service companies have reported more than 20% employee attrition rate. On the back of this, IT companies have implemented measures to fight the rising attrition challenge, such with initiatives like frequent promotions, bonuses, higher salary, and hikes were also implemented. Now, in quarter two, the attrition rate at top IT services companies showed it is moderating on a sequential basis. While the attrition rates have slightly moderated, it still remains at elevated levels. We keep our reservation on the attrition outlook, but here are some factors that could pull down attrition rates. They are impending economic slowdown, employee retention initiatives by IT firms, and also layoffs by startups. Now, overall, the performance of IT companies have been good based on the quarterly performances numbers that have been out. There were no negative surprises in numbers and management commentary was also upbeat. But a potential US and global recession does pose threat to India's IT growth as a chunk of India's IT revenues comes from the US and other advanced economies. Now, take a look at the chart of Tata Consultancy, Services, Enforces, Wipro, HCL Technologies revenue distribution by geography. The US market contributes anywhere between 40% to 60% of the revenues earned by the IT companies. The European markets contribute up to 30% of the revenues. Now, even if IT services are crucial for companies across all sectors, it may be overly optimistic to think that everything would work out just fine for the IT companies. Aggressive rate hikes have aggravated the risk of recession in developed economies such as the US and the UK and Europe too. In a recession, companies will be forced to cut their spending in several segments, including IT expenses, which will simply result in delayed or cancelled orders or a shrinking order pipeline. But IT companies with a broad range of competencies are predicted to weather the slump better. Now, since the last six months, Nifty IT has underperformed Nifty 50. Now, there could be many unknown, unknown risks ahead that could impact valuations going forward. Now, there are tough times ahead for the IT sector, but do know that this particular industry has weathered much turbulence and has enormous growth potential, and this will have a minor impact on the long-term growth story of the Indian IT sector. Going forward, we believe that these are the key metrics to track. Hiring momentum and attrition rate trends, commentary on the deal pipeline and any signs of slowdown, delay and cancellation in deals, revenue growth of top clients and core verticals, and margin outlook amid slowing revenue growth. At a time when the world is facing a geopolitical crisis and the fear of recession, investing in any asset class seems risky. In these high inflationary times, it should be the perfect time to hold own gold. The yellow metal has historically rallied when inflation is high. But gold prices haven't surged. In fact, they're down about 10% from the recent March peak. When the Ukraine crisis started, gold prices spiked. However, they declined later. Danteras, which marks the first day of Diwali in India, is considered to be very auspicious to buy gold and silver as part of the Hindu festivities. Now, ahead of Danteras, gold prices were down 5,000 rupees from this year's high. 
Let's understand why. Gold is an asset which inherently does not yield any interest or income and is purely driven by demand and supply. Hence, one of the factors which may be causing prices of gold to be down now is that the demand for gold is not that strong among market participants and they're preferring other assets which may be providing them with better returns. The September inflation print in the US was 8.2% year over year. This was lower than the 8.3% which is registered in August. Although the inflation has moderated a bit, it is far from the central bank's target of 2%. Thus, hot inflation numbers would keep the aggressive tightening window open for the Fed. Now, rising interest rates increases the opportunity cost of holding gold since the gold does not pay interest, so it's always competing with other interest-bearing assets such as bonds. This makes investors dump gold when interest rates rise and move to other assets such as bonds and fixed deposits that pay interest. The weakness in gold right now is also partly to the strengthening of the US dollar. Now, this is an outcome of rising interest rates in the US to contain inflation. An interest rate hike in the US increases the returns on dollar investments, leading the money to flow into the US and causing the dollar to strengthen. Now, do remember when the value of the US dollar rises, the value of gold falls. Similarly, as the value of dollar falls, the value of gold rises. In simple terms, dollar and gold have a negative relationship. We will tell you why. Gold is denominated in US dollars, and hence when the dollar appreciates, the foreign currency depreciates, which means more amount of money is needed to buy the same quantity of gold. This depresses the demand and hence the value. Now, gold is a volatile asset class and here are multiple factors that will drive the price of gold in the short term. And the outlook is extremely uncertain due to rapidly changing economic environment. Now, higher interest rates, a stronger dollar and high inflation are all factors that will drive the price in the short term. Now, Indians have also long bought gold during the festive season. Tradition and religious sentiments play a vital role in this habit. This too will have an impact on the gold prices domestically. However, in the long term, do remember that gold prices have an inverse relationship with dollar and a positive correlation with inflation. A sovereign credit rating is an independent assessment of the credit worthiness of a country. Now, creditworthiness here means the ability of the government to pay back its debt without default. It gives investors insights into the level of the risk associated with investing in the debt instruments of a given country. Sovereign rating is useful to understand the risk of bonds issued by the government across the world. Now, there are three main rating agencies, Moody's, Standard & Poor's and Fitch. The credit rating scale comparison looks something like this. In the case of Standard & Poor's and Fitch, ratings range from D denoting payment defaults to AAA indicating strong capacity to meet financial commitments. Standard & Poor's and Fitch's credit rating for India stands at BBB- with a stable outlook, while Moody's credit rating for India is at BAA3 with a stable outlook. Now, there are many debates and opinions about the credibility of credit agencies. The Economic Survey 2021 called for a more transparent methodology for credit ratings, making it less subjective. Now, it also stated that India's sovereign credit rating do not capture the fundamentals of its economy. Now, despite such debates, any change in the credit rating of our economy does make news every single time there is a revision. Now, it is essential for a developing country like India as it can impact FPI inflow into equity and debt instrument into the country. Now, coming to Fitch comments on India's sovereign rating. In its previous outlook revision, Fitch upgraded India's rating to stable from negative and said downside risk to medium-term growth have diminished due to India's rapid economic recovery and easing financial sector weaknesses. In the most recent comments made by Fitch, India has adequate foreign exchange reserves and its current account deficit is likely to remain at sustainable levels limiting any risk to the country's sovereign rating from external pressure. Now, it said India's external finances are becoming less of a strength but continues to be sufficient to cushion risk emanating from abroad. Let's examine this statement. 
It's no secret that the RBI has been selling dollars from its reserves to ensure that there is no sharp decline or depreciation in the value of the rupee. Given the volatile global backdrop, there will be fluctuations in foreign exchange reserves. The RBI will continue to use reserves to manage exchange rate volatility. This will probably erode reserve buffers further in the near term. But as of now, the fall is not alarming as we still have adequate reserves to fight external challenges. Now take a look at our import cover when we compare it to the two previous crises. Reserve cover remains strong at about 8.9 months of imports in September. This is higher than during the taper tantrum in 2013 when it stood at about 6.5 months. Now coming to current account deficit, many are expecting CAD to exceed 3% of GDP. CAD has breached the 3% mark only twice since 1990. This has happened once during the balance of payment crisis in 1991 and the one following the US Federal Reserve's taper tantrum in 2013. Now, Fitch pegs India's CAD in the fiscal year ending March 2023 to reach 3.4% of GDP from 1.2% in fiscal year 22. Now, when you compare this number with the taper tantrum crisis, it is still lower. Now, according to Fitch, CAD is likely to narrow to 2% of GDP in the next fiscal year, aided by easing global prices. Now, however, the increasing CAD need not be interpreted as a sign of an impending economic catastrophe, but rather as a sign of an elevated external risk. Now, over the last 15 years, India's external debt has increased steadily in absolute terms. External debt now amounts to about $620.7 billion, up from $139.1 billion in 2006. However, during this time, India's GDP has also grown significantly. As a result, the ratio of external debt to GDP stays at a manageable level. Gross external debt stood at 22% of GDP, which is low compared with the median of 72% for triple B rated sovereigns in 2021 and also compared to other periods. For debt repayment, a country needs to have adequate foreign exchange reserves. If you look at the forex reserves as a percentage of the debt, it stands at around 95.5% which is better than during the taper tantrum crisis. So currently, foreign exchange reserves are, are adequate for any debt repayment purposes. When we look at India's external finances data, it still looks good despite the macroeconomic stability. On the back of a solid external position and fundamentals, we conclude that the impact of the current macroeconomic challenges won't put serious pressure on the economy. While I say this, this is me, Merlin Susanna signing off, wishing you and your loved ones a very happy Diwali. Thank you and take care. Did you like watching this video? Then download our app, Informed Investor, to watch more such informative and interesting videos.